To motivate our foray into computer science, I want to start with a puzzle that may be familiar to some of you. This is a cryptorhythm. 40 plus 10 plus 10 is equal to 60. To solve this puzzle, we need to assign letters to digits so that the resulting arithmetic statement is true. First, some ground rules. 1. Every digit can correspond to exactly one letter. And 2. No leading zeros are allowed. With these two rules in place, let's try to solve this puzzle using deductive reasoning. If you've seen the solution before, or just want to see the computational strategy, feel free to skip ahead using the timestamps. With that said, let's begin. Looking at the first column, we get the following equation. If you haven't seen this notation before, we read it as y plus 2n is congruent to y mod 10. This is equivalent to saying that y is the remainder when you divide y plus 2n by 10. In other words, y is the digit left in the ones place after adding up y, n, and n. If we consider possible values for n, the only ones that work are 5 and 0. 0 clearly works because y plus 0 is always equal to y. The reason 5 also works is because 5 plus 5 is equal to 10, and adding 10 won't change the one place digit. Looking at the next column, we get a similar equation, except with the possibility of a carry from the first column. Let's suppose there was a carry. If so, then t plus 2e plus 1 would have a remainder of t when divided by 10. Notice that 2e plus 1 will always be odd, regardless of what you assign e. If t is even and you add an odd number to it, it will become odd. Likewise, if t is odd, adding an odd number will make it even. From this, we can conclude that it is impossible to divide t plus 2e plus 1 by 10 and get back the remainder t. This tells us that our assumption of a carry was wrong, i.e. there couldn't have been a carry from the first column. From this, we can conclude that n must be 0, since setting it equal to 5 would create a carry. Moreover, when the second column doesn't have a carry, it has the same structure as the first column. This means e can also either be 0 or 5. But since we've already set n equal to 0, e must be 5. Let's fill this in and mark 0 and 5 as used digits before we continue. Now, looking at the fifth column, we have the equation f plus the carry from the fourth column is equal to s. Since f can't equal s by our first rule, carry 4 must be greater than 0. Specifically, since the fourth column only has one term to add, carry 4 equals exactly 1. This carry condition allows us to force the fourth column to be o plus carry 3 is equal to i plus 10. Knowing precisely what the carry must be is helpful because it allows us to bypass modular congruences and work with equations directly. As there are three terms in the third column, carry 3 can either be 0, 1, or 2. Let's consider each of these cases one by one. If carry 3 was 0, then we would run into the same problem as before. O cannot equal i. If carry 3 was 1, our equation would then force O to equal 9 and i to equal 0. This doesn't work because we already set n equal to 0. By process of elimination, carry 3 must be 2. Moreover, O must equal 9, since setting it equal to 8 would create the same problem of two letters being 0. Therefore, O must be 9 and I must be 1. Let's fill this in as well. Looking at the third column, we can derive the following equation. r plus 2t plus 1 is equal to 20 plus x. Since no value of t will make a carry of 2, we know the carry from the previous column is exactly 1. We also know that the carry from this column is exactly 2, which gives us the 20 on the right-hand side. Since r plus 1 can be at most 9, for the left-hand side to be greater than 20, t has to be greater than or equal to 6. But remember, we already used 0 and 1 in the previous steps. This means that the smallest value we can assign x is 2, so our right-hand side must be at least 22. Setting t equal to 6 no longer works, which narrows the choices for t down to 7 or 8. Let's explore each of these possibilities. While doing so, we can mark the digits we attempt to assign as blue to mean unconfirmed. Suppose t was equal to 7. This simplifies our equation to r plus 15 is equal to 20 plus x. 
The only way we can assign digits for this to be true is setting r to equal 8 and x to equal 3. This seems to work, right? But wait, let's not forget the first equation we have in front of us. f plus 1 equals s means that s and f are adjacent numbers. But if we set t to equal 7, we no longer have any adjacencies in our remaining digits. This means t must be 8. As a sanity check, let's see if this problem still occurs when t is equal to 8. Setting t equal to 8 simplifies our equation to r plus 17 is equal to 20 plus x. Aha! If we set r equal to 7 and x equal to 4, we don't have any adjacency problems. We still have 2 and 3 as an adjacent pair of digits. We can set f and s to 2 and 3, which leaves just 6 for y. And we're done. But does this solution work? To make sure we didn't mess up anywhere, here are the original letters, as well as the original puzzle. Comparing them side by side, it looks like our assignment works. Now that we found our solution, you might ask, using deductive logic works seamlessly for this puzzle, so why bother introducing the complexities of computing? One possible reason is that these puzzles are hard. Reasoning about carries across columns in modular arithmetic isn't easy. Harder yet is the adjacency argument we used to assign the last couple letters. What if we ran into a puzzle that required vastly trickier insights? Another reason is that in trying to solve this puzzle logically, we secretly assumed that a solution not only existed, but that it was reachable using just deduction. How would you know if we gave you a problem that didn't have a valid solution? For these reasons, let's see how we can reformulate the problem. Looking closer, our solution can be concisely expressed as a table that maps letters to digits. Notice that this mapping is the only information we need to verify that a solution is correct. We can just plug the digits in place of the letters and see if the resulting statement is true. Similarly, if I give you a different mapping, we can quickly see that it doesn't work. Assuming the order of the letters is fixed, different digit orders naturally correspond to different solutions. Moving forward, let's refer to these digit orderings as permutations. Now, if a solution does exist, it can be expressed as a permutation. This means that exhaustively searching every possible permutation will eventually give us a solution. Reframing this problem in terms of permutations allows us to flip the script. Instead of using logic to find the solution that works, why don't we just try every possible permutation? Representing the puzzle as a permutation search might be conceptually simpler. However, sitting at a desk and plugging in permutations for hours sounds impossibly tedious. This is where computers come in to save the day. Simple, repetitive tasks are perfectly suited for brute force computation. With a couple lines of code, we can program a computer to check all the possible solutions for us. The program simply has to generate every possible permutation, and then plug in the digits to see if it meets our requirements for a valid solution. With that said, let's see it in action. As expected, we eventually found the same solution that we found deductively. But how many permutations do we have to check in the process? Let's consider the possible choices for each letter, one at a time. For n, we have 10 choices of digits to assign it to. We know from the solution that the correct digit is 0, so I've highlighted it in green. Once we pick a digit for n, we have 9 remaining digits that we can assign to i. Similarly, we have 8 digits for f, 7 for s, and so on. We can get the total number of permutations by multiplying the number of choices at each step, like so. This number, 10 times 9 times 8 times everything to 1, is also called 10 factorial. That's a big number. Thankfully, it's still small enough to be computable. However, the factorial function grows incredibly quickly. For example, if we were considering permutations of 70 elements, there would be more possible solutions than atoms in the universe. Can we do any better? Let's take a third look at the cryptorhythm. In my opinion, the hardest step in so solving the puzzle deductively was the adjacency argument. 
The previous digit assignments were relatively easier to reason out. Let's suppose we tried to solve the puzzle deductively and got stuck after assigning n, i, e, and o. In some sense, we know these digits must be assigned as such because no other assignment logically holds. What if we keep these letters fixed and only consider permutations of the remaining unknown letters? Intuitively, we're restricting the number of digits that we have left to assign, which should reduce the number of permutations that we need to check. To illustrate this fact, let's revisit the possible choices for each letter. For n, i, e, and o, because we solved it deductively, there's only one possible choice for each of them. By the same argument as before, there are six choices for f, five for s, four for x, and so on. Once we multiply them all together, the ones disappear, and we're left with 6 factorial. How much of a difference is there between 6 factorial and 10 factorial? Clearly, 6 factorial is smaller, because we don't multiply by 7, 8, 9, and 10. But how much exactly? Let's consider their ratio, or what percentage of 10 factorial 6 factorial is. Simplifying gives us this, which is a little bit less than 0.02%. That's tiny by comparison. Since the computer must check every permutation, reducing the search space to 6 instead of 10 lets us skip over 99% of digit permutations. So, what do we learn through this problem? Firstly, computers are our problem-solving friends. They're incredibly helpful for solving problems that require a lot of structured calculation. However, they can only help us as much as we allow them to. The way you instruct or program a computer has a huge impact on how efficiently it can find a solution. And now, armed with the power of computation, let's solve some more cryptorhythms. Every time a valid solution is found, the numbers will flash green. Notice that some of these puzzles don't have unique solutions. Trying to solve them deductively would be near impossible since there isn't a clear next step at every junction. Yet another advantage of computer-aided search. I've animated a random sampling of these permutations here, since showing all 10 factorial of them would have either looked like a blur taken hours of your time. I did, however, find the exact number of solutions to each of these cryptorhythms, namely 2 and 22. On that note, let's consider these puzzles solved. 